Thank you for tuning in to the Black Money Tree Podcast, hosted by entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, Jerome D. Love. We are committed to teaching you how to build wealth so that you can build your community. At the Black Money Tree, our goal is to empower wealth creation and create economic self-sufficiency in order to empower generations to come. Society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never enjoy. Season is powered by Wells Fargo Bank. Welcome to the Black Money Tree Podcast. Hey, hey, this is Jerome D. Love, CEO and founder of the Texas Black Expo, and of course, your host of the Black Money Tree Podcast. And we're so excited to be back for season three. And today we're going to have a wonderful episode. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and y'all know what that is. It's real estate. I got my real estate license when I was 19 years old. So I know everything from being a real estate agent to building the houses to managing the properties to helping other people buy and sell houses. But we have a guy here today who's really changing the game. And you know, at the Black Money Tree, it's all about putting money in your pocket, creating wealth. And, uh, and the gentleman we have here today is Mr. Chris, Chris Senegal. He's doing some amazing things in terms of real estate, and he's really changing the game and helping to create a lot of millionaires along the way. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us on the Black Money Tree Podcast. No problem. No problem. Pleasure to be here. So tell us, introduce yourself real quick. Tell mm -hmm. the people who you are, what you do, and mm -hmm. then we're going to get into it. Okay, cool. So I'm Christopher Senegal. Um, I consider myself a social impact real estate developer. Okay. I focus on projects in our neighborhoods that are going through gentrification um, with a zero displacement model. So whether I'm buying rental portfolios to keep residents there, whether I'm buying blighted commercial property to build new construction to bring people back to the community, everything is focused on us rebuilding our own neighborhoods. So when you say social impact, that pretty much trying to build the community, specifically the African-American Co community. Correct. So for sounds like you have a – greater good it's not yeah. just all about the numbers for you yeah 100 percent. when i started off in 2008 i was flipping houses and i realized i was accelerating gentrification sometimes because the person that taught me how to do it didn't care about the neighborhood that i was doing it in and the people that i was displacing in the process so i hit reset on that and i said well there's got to be a better way to do this how do we rebuild our communities and bring them back to the the life that they had before desegregation literally and so that's been my approach so let's talk about flipping houses mm -hmm. now my sh I've never flipped a house yet, mm -hmm. and I, I have what I have done is when I've built them from the ground up, I have mm -hmm. sold them. Mm -hmm. And my primary thought process and pro uh, and, and processing there was, if if it took me, well, let me back it back. When I was doing it at that time, mm -hmm. I was going to the tax auction and I was yeah. buying houses ten thousand, twenty thousand, yeah. thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I started building houses. Mm -hmm. Those same houses that I was buying 10, 20, and 30 are mm -hmm. now 60, 70. Yeah. So when I did the numbers, ultimately for me, I'm always trying to make my money, make as much money as possible. Mm -hmm. So if I got to build a house for 160,000, mm -hmm. I can sell it and make 50,000. Mm -hmm. And now I have 200,000, so I can buy two mm -hmm. that I could rehab. Yeah. You know, so that's the kind of the way I looked at it. Mm -hmm. What made you flip? versus want to rent um cash flow so you know you can get cash strapped in real estate if you, if, you, if if you don't especially if you're starting out young you don't have a big cash reserve by the time you put two or three down payments on stuff and then you have these uh homes where the let's say that the net cash flow is four or five hundred dollars a month you have one roof issue you got to replace a roof if for some reason if it's not covered by insurance or something that's gonna wipe out all your profit for the whole year yeah. So, so you do that two or three times, or you have a house where a tenant vandalizes it, a tenant squats on the property and doesn't pay the rent. You got to pay those mortgage payments for three or four months. You, you can actually go cash flow negative and be in a bad position. However, if you flip a few houses first, and you have 100000 150000 in the bank, then you have reserves to, to float you through those bad times. Okay, that's interesting. That's an interesting <laughs> perspective. I, I certainly didn't expect you to say cash flow. Because uh -huh. to me, that's why I keep my rental houses, because I want cash flow. Uh -huh. But I, you did make me think a little bit different. When I started, I bought my first house when I was 21. Mm -hmm. By the time I was 24, I had about eight doors. Mm -hmm. But I was doing loans on all of them. Yeah. So when the dot-com burst right around 2001, mm -hmm. Iraq war, had properties in Killeen, mm -hmm. largest army base in the country, mm -hmm. half the population left, mm -hmm. all my tenants left. Yeah. To get new tenants back, had to cut my rents in half. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I ended up about five, six foreclosures. Right, exactly. So 
for me, when I got back in the game, mm -hmm. I started buying cash. Yeah. And I, I went to the low end. Yeah. $10,000, 30000 a fix up, mm -hmm. now I'm making $900 a month. Mm -hmm. So that was always my strategy. And that's why I think cash flow is better on the rental. But go ahead. We're saying the same thing. You know, okay. why, we, you know okay. why we're saying the same thing? Okay. Because you started off doing rental properties first, but you didn't have enough cash. Yeah. yeah. So you, just, you just said that. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, exactly what I described is what you said just happened to you. You said yeah. they all went in foreclosure. Yeah. So then you had to go stack cash and then you started, then you could buy. So if the, the average, especially African American in any community at the age of 22, 25, doesn't have enough cash to go buy any, to go buy a house cash. Yeah. Plus they have to renovate it. Right. So that's why it's good to flip a few first. Then you have that nest egg. So you, you can, I, I would flip one or two and then flip one. If it was a good rental, I would keep it instead of selling it. Because yeah. because I would capture that equity and just keep doing that process over and over. You know, it's it's interesting you saying that because I had a conversation with a young lady uh, who I actually helped buy her first house. Mm -hmm. She bought it, did a loan. I think she bought it somewhere in the neighborhood about ninety five, ninety eight thousand. Mm -hmm. So her notes, probably uh, taxes, insurance, everything, maybe a thousand. I believe she's renting it uh, thirteen, fourteen hundred. Mm -hmm. And her, she just wants to get an apartment. I want to mm -hmm. get an apartment complex. How mm -hmm. am I going to do it? Yeah. And I'm kind of like, well, you got to build somewhere. Yeah. So uh, interesting perspective, though. So ultimately, in that scenario, what you would advise, sell it. She probably could sell it for 150 mm -hmm. put 30 40 in a pocket, mm -hmm. then buy something else, mm -hmm. and then sell that one, put another 30 40 in your pocket, and mm -hmm. do that three or four times, right. build up to – a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand, and then now you you're in the game where you may yeah. be in a position to get an apartment complex. Yeah, no, but let me tell you my my, my shortcut to success. Okay, I got the success triangle. There's three things you need to be successful at whatever you do. You need the knowledge and experience. You need the opportunity, and you need the money. So she don't have to wait till she has all the money. She can go find the right opportunity, the right apartment complex. Take the the profit that she got from one deal. And then go talk to other. She can go talk to one of your previous podcast guests, like I know Najee. Yeah. Say, hey, is this a good deal? Would you want to partner with me on this? That's your shortcut to get to the to the, to the multifamily instead of yeah. waiting until you save it and do it yourself. I think the school system and corporate America has conditioned us to believe we got to figure it all out. Yeah. Right. The shortcut is partner with people that got the other pieces to the puzzle, and you get to the to finish line faster, and you learn from people that's already successful at it. Yeah. Well, I I can't argue with that there, but what I've told her. Mm -hmm. And what I would tell myself when mm -hmm. I was 20, mm -hmm. 21, is be patient. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we want to walk before we can crawl. She mm -hmm. just bought her first house and she wants mm -hmm. an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, well, buy another house and another mm -hmm. one. And for me, I'm I'm considering the multifamily game right mm -hmm. now. And we'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that okay. versus the single family here yeah. in a minute. I'm gonna help you, yeah. I'm gonna have you solve a debate, me and OJ <laughs> keep having. Okay. But from my perspective, you know, I, I just found where having rentals and the mm -hmm. cash flow mm -hmm. has helped me more mm -hmm. in not having any notes. Right. Now, but you got to understand, I'm a guy who started his first business at 19. Mm -hmm. Never had a real job mm -hmm. or a regular check. Yeah. So when I got in the game, my whole thing was I need money coming in. Mm -hmm. So it would allow me to be freer in my entrepreneurial ventures, such as black expo mm -hmm. and writing my books yeah. and all of that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and that's one of the things I often tell people when I talk to them, I say, it's, it's no real right or wrong. Right. It's not, it's not you got to right. understand what's right for you. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to my dad, he had retired bunch of money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And all I'm thinking is grow that money. Daddy, yeah. you need to buy your house. And my dad looked at me, he said, boy, I ain't trying to chase no goddamn tenant around or nothing. Yeah. So he was in a whole different yeah. place in his life. He wasn't trying. He was good. He was yeah. like, I'm good. I don't need it. Yeah. But when you start now, you may be looking in a different direction. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the multifamily game and this mm -hmm. debate that me and OJ, he's, a, he's yeah. one of our favorite guests here on the Black Money Tree Podcast. So I have single family house. Mm -hmm. He's into the multifamily, and mm -hmm. we've kind of gone back and forth on which is more advantageous. Yeah. The the primary advantage that I could see that he has, and he's kind of starting to sway me a little bit, is the forced appreciation mm -hmm. and the the way in which you could finance it and get loans mm -hmm. and uh, commercial. Where do you what, What's your perspective on that? <laughs> I'm going to meet y'all in the middle. Okay. You know why all of the largest investment institutions in the country are now doing build for rent, bu buying portfolios of single-family homes? Why is that? Because when you package it up, it, it can it can be considered a commercial asset. Yeah. 
you get you get the the value appreciation of just the natural sales in the neighborhood but you also can value it and force the force the value appreciation collectively when you raise the rents on the entire uh, tenant base that you have so so both answers are right now if there's a fire I'm gonna want to go your route yeah right single family because uh, well I mean of course we know insurance will cover all that stuff yeah but but when you think about the actual lives of the tenants and what's at risk it's better to have an isolated incident well, uh, where, where, where you know, there, there's an emergency versus all your tenants affected in one building. So for, for that aspect of it, I like single family more. Yeah. Um, but, you know, multifamily, you got shared roof, you got, sh- you know, shared parking lot. Um, and you have a higher density of, of doors in, a, in the same location versus, uh, you know, the commute from place to place. You know, you have one maintenance manager, one property manager on site all times. You can watch, yeah. all, watch all your tenants and everything. So both of them have their, 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 yeah. their pluses and minuses, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say two things on that. Number one, the, the primary advantage he was sharing with me and mm-hmm. when he looked at my, he was kind of saying one location, one roof, kind of what you just said. Mm-hmm. Now, all of my houses, mm-hmm. 85% are all in 77033. Right, yeah. You mm-hmm. know, I got one in 045. Yeah. I just bought one in 048, but yeah. they all literally one street, next street, da 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 Right. So, from that perspective, I'm not driving all around town, yeah. uh, which is one of the biggest hindrances for mm-hmm. him, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of in one area. So yeah. some of the, the pain points that he had mm-hmm. aren't the pain points that yeah. I had. Mm-hmm. Now, secondly, I just want to make sure a lot of people, our viewers are starting in real estate. They want to mm-hmm. get into it. So I want to really break down that force appreciation. Yeah. So ultimately what we're saying is. If you have a house, single family house, a regular house, how do they determine the value on it? I.e. how much money will be given on it? Mm-hmm. It's based upon comps, what mm-hmm. the other houses in the neighborhood are selling for. Mm-hmm. When you have a commercial asset, mm-hmm. it's based upon the income. Mm-hmm. So if you can get a thousand dollars a month, that's twelve thousand a year. Yeah. They may say the value for that is one hundred and twenty thousand. That's right. just yeah. easy. But if you can get that up to two thousand a month mm-hmm. and then you got uh, twenty four thousand a year. They may yeah. say that's worth two forty. Yeah. So the name of the game is to get the asset, mm-hmm. get the rents up, mm-hmm. which gets the appraisal up, which increases the amount that you can pull out. Is that correct? One hundred percent correct. And um, you know, take it a step further. If you increase, if you improve the class of the property, so uh, the way that that valuation is called the capitalization rate. So, um, let's say you want to make ten percent return. Um, and you want to make, but, but that ten percent return has to be ten thousand dollars. That means you have to have uh, like a hundred thousand dollars in value there, right? So somebody's saying, if I want to make ten thousand dollars, I'll spend hundred thousand dollars on this property if I want a ten percent return. That's a ten percent cap rate. Now, the, that same property with that same cash flow, if somebody says I just want five percent return, they'll pay two hundred thousand dollars for that same property. Yeah. So when you lower the cap rate, which is the, the expected return because they feel like it's more stable investment, you as the owner that's going to sell it to them or that's going to borrow against that money can borrow. You have, you have way more equity, you have way more borrowing power, you, know, you have way more profit on the same property without the, the houses, I mean, the, the property, the buildings around you can be vacant. It, it wouldn't make a difference. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I know you get creative mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of the ways in which you fund your properties and mm-hmm. you, you're doing some crowdfunding. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot about crowdfunding, don't mm-hmm. really necessarily understand it, but from my understanding, it's kind of where you pool a bunch of people's money. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that crowdfunding. Yeah. What are some of the advantages? Mm-hmm. I guess versus a traditional bank or yeah. your 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 private equity firms or just an individual investor. Talk a little bit about that. So and that's, that's the part where the social impact comes in, because um, you know a lot of times when our neighborhoods are going through gentrification, we point to the mayor, we want to the city council, we we want LeBron or Jay Z or Oprah to come save us. When collectively we have enough buying power within our own community to save some of these properties, and so. Um, on the, the, the opportunities where I find like rental portfolios where, and, uh, and let me talk about this really quickly. We talk about generational wealth. Owning a whole bunch of real estate is not generational wealth. That's passive income of f- free cash flow for you. If you don't set up the right systems, you're gonna lose that in the next generation. And that's, that's what I've been seeing a lot of in like neighbors like Fifth Award. So I'm going, I'm finding these, these heirs that are taking these entire real estate portfolios that they're getting from their parents and just wanna sell them. Yeah. Or just want to hold them, but they they're, they're tired landlords. So I go to them, and I can like owner finance a whole portfolio, like a whole block of property. Literally, I've been doing this since 2013. So sometimes I'll just do it myself. But if if I find one where it's like the tenants have been there for a long time, and I know when I buy it, the tenants aren't going anywhere. That's that's a low risk investment. 
So for things like that, I can say, hey, everybody in the community, do y'all want to invest with me on this? So the, the first one I did, I bought a block that had 18 houses and uh, two vacant commercial buildings uh, for like 1.2 million. Um, owner financed it with $600,000 down. They gave me two years to pay the other 600,000 with no payment in between. I did the crowdfund to raise 1.2 million. So I was able to pay the down payment, have money in the bank to renovate some of the units, then um, take the, one of the, well, both of the vacant commercial buildings now, turn them into like event spaces, creative spaces, kind of like what we have here set up um, and build up so much cash flow off of that to where I don't have to raise the rents on the residents because the neighborhood is going through gentrification and they are usually getting displaced, right? So crowdfunding allows us to have opportunities to do things like that. Deeper than that, some of my investors are people that are in their 60s and 50s and 60s that live in the community that have been renting their entire life. They said they never thought they could own a piece of Fifth Ward. Now they can drive past that block and say, I have equity, I have ownership in this project right here. So it, it's bigger than just a, a leverage point. Um, it's it, it's a, it's about the social impact. Now, it is a big headache though. Yeah, dealing with fifteen hundred people putting in two hundred and fifty five hundred dollars, and some of them don't understand the investing. It, it can be a big headache. So it's definitely a passion play. Um, it's not a get rich quick play at all. Um, but yeah, I, I use I use it in certain scenarios. So so break down what crowdfunding is. Do you you I mean I know it's probably a lot of different ways. Basically, pooling money from a bunch of people. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Do you put a website up and people mm -hmm. can sign in? Do you have to have investment agreements for 150, 200 people? How mm -hmm. does that work? Yeah, so I, I give you two comparisons and tell you how they merge together. Number one is GoFundMe. Okay. When you put, you, you put a campaign up on GoFundMe, you push it out to people, and your marketing, your story is what determines how much money you raise. The difference is with GoFundMe, those people are donating that. They're not looking for anything back. Crowdfunding is the same approach, but they want their money back. They want to know what's going on. They want a profit. They want it on time. So that's that. That's the other side of taking a lot of folks' money because you have a lot of people to answer to. Yeah. Now, the, the as far as pooling money to buy something, that's what every big institution does in the world. In, in, in the world. Yeah. Um, but it used to be only accessible to people in the United States, what who they call accredited investors. So if you wanted to be a part of a multi-million dollar acquisition, you want to put in 50,000, 100,000, a million, whatever you want to put in, you had to have a personal net worth over a million dollars outside of your primary residence, or you had to have a personal income of $200,000 a year for the past two years, or if, if you're a couple, you had to have an income of $300,000 a year for the past two years. Then the, the SEC says, oh, well, you're financially savvy enough to be a part of this. Otherwise, anybody else is too ignorant to be a part, which is really crap. Um, um, so that, that always excluded all of the majority of us in our community from ever being able to be a part of a big syndication that's buying a strip center, buying a hotel, you know, whatever. Um, well, when Barack Obama was in office, he created the Jobs Act where it basically democratized it. It said, hey, no, anybody now, you can, you can, you can invest up to 10% of your income and pool your money together with other people to be able to invest in whatever you want. It could be a business, it could be real estate, it could be whatever. So one of, one of my mentors, his favorite saying is, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when people ask me what I do in terms of investing in real estate and things mm -hmm. of that nature, they bring up a lot of horror stories and mm -hmm. scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, that's not my truth. Right. You, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. The way I do it, I don't have a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. So that being said, one of the things that interested me in what you said about buying the block, mm -hmm. but also scared me was, how do you buy 18 houses, one block? They're different owners. How do you get them all on one accord together? And or how does that work? That's, that's what to me just, because I, I some of my properties, I see so much potential in South uh -huh. Park. Yeah. And I want to buy the entire street of Malmody right yeah. off of 16. Yeah. And I see how um, in Austin they have some areas where they have these houses and they've kind of, developing into these little shops. That's my vision for that area. Yeah. But I'm kind of like, how do you get 40 people uh -huh. all to sell to you? Well, you know? well, I mean, to answer that, I, I have not had to do that. Okay, but, okay. But, but in, scattered site infield developers have to do that, and that's called options. So you go to one house, you put an option on it, say, hey, here's $500. I may come back and buy your house later in the next year, and you have to sell it to me at the agreed upon price. You go door to door until you get the whole block. That way you're not out of a whole lot of money. Now, if you don't get everybody, whoever you gave that money to, they get to keep that. 
but that's how developers really really accumulate a lot of a whole bunch of different owners so 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 let me let me go back so 10 houses on the block i go to house one and mm-hmm. say hey i want to buy your house for a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars but mm-hmm. only if i can buy the rest of these yes do you agree they say yeah mm-hmm. here's a thousand dollars now i'm gonna work on these other ones yep. if i can get it i'm gonna come back to you yep if that's the way it works yep okay if, if you'll hear from me in 12 months a thousand dollars is yours and the, the contract is off the commitment okay is off. And yeah. what is the term for that again? Uh, option. option, option contract. Okay, yeah. okay. You're yeah. not even a real estate. You are you a realtor? No, no. Oh, I'm just, man, I'm just, you I'm educate just... me. I'm a real estate <laughs> broker for 25 <laughs> years, and you teaching me so. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I own three blocks right now. The first one was a, a, a old uh, Jewish dentist who had a grocery store on Liberty Road in Fifth Ward and five or six houses behind it. When he passed away, he gave that to one of his kids. That guy actually owned 26 blocks at Fifth Ward at one point in time. Hmm. So that's how I got the first block. The second block was um, y- you go in the communities, you'll see these little cottage houses that were all built at one point in time. So there's, there's usually one owner for those too. So that's what the buy the block project is. The third project is the, the, the biggest real estate owner in all of our communities is the church. They own acres and acres everywhere all over Houston. So the third site that I own is the Pleasant Grove church site right there in the section of I-10 and 59. It's 5.3 acres. So each, each, each um, ownership or each each uh, land deal was different or property deal was different, but I only look for ones where it's it's contiguous parcels because you're right, it is too much headache trying to do yeah piecemeal things together like that. Okay, okay. So take me back. Mm-hmm. Where did where did you s- develop your interest mm-hmm. in real estate? How did you grow up? Was your dad in real estate? Your mom in real estate? Were there <laughs> what? Tell me a little bit how you grew up, what you okay. were taught about money and wealth, and how you got into real estate and where yeah. you are today. All right, so I uh, grew up with two, two separate households. Uh, my dad worked in oil and gas at the refinery. Um, my mom ended up being an entrepreneur. She was a uh, family and marriage therapist and psychologist, but she became an entrepreneur out of, because she was forced to because she was working for a racist company, and she started just working for herself. But yeah. she didn't really instill any entrepreneurial principles in that. I just saw her go work in her own little office that she had. Um, I went to college for civil engineering. Oh, back up, I was a teenage dad. Okay. So um, I had my son when I was 16. Uh, he just graduated college from U of H on a full academic scholarship. He's now a realtor and okay. he works for the city of San Antonio's development department. Okay, I'm from San Antonio. Okay, okay, yeah, there yeah, you go. Okay. Well, There's a connection. Um, so then I got out of college, civil engineering degree, started working in corporate America. I was an industrial engineer working for the railroad, so I was building like locomotive repair shops or bridges and all that kind of stuff, but I hated corporate. Yeah. So I just started reading books and real estate just kept coming up over and over and over. It's like a great way to g- generate first, gen- first generation wealth. So that's how I got into real estate. Um, I, when I moved to Houston, I just happened to have a, a, one of my, my frat brothers working for Homevestors, the big wholesalers. Yeah. And so uh, this was during the 2008 recession. They had a whole bunch of inventory. So I, he brought me in, we negotiated a deal. I bought my first house. I, I borrowed against the little money I had in the 401k, used it for a down payment on a hard money loan to flip the first house. That's how I got started. Okay. Yeah. Now talk a little bit about the, I often tell when I, when I speak mm-hmm. and I do the flipping versus rental mm-hmm. and I, I kind of mm-hmm. don't talk much about flipping. Yeah. Because what I found is you have a house, $50,000, you mm-hmm. buy it, you put 20,000 in it, it's worth a hundred. Mm-hmm. And now you got 30,000 in equity. Mm-hmm. And I say that ain't 30,000 in equity. Mm-hmm. Cause you got to pay your taxes mm-hmm. you got to sell it. So you got title fees, you mm-hmm. got realtor fees, you got mm-hmm. da, da, da. So mm-hmm. that 30,000 may be down to 18. Yeah. But now if you take that 18, mm-hmm. go on a trip and do mm-hmm. some other stuff. Now mm-hmm. you, you, you out of money. Yeah. So talk about the structure and some of the discipline that's mm-hmm. necessary to yeah. take that 18, yeah. to put it somewhere else, yeah. to make that 18 36 mm-hmm. and to kind of grow mm-hmm. the way we, we discussed yeah. earlier. I, I think HGTV has spoiled us. Yeah. Like, like those, those are, that's un- unrealistic scenarios. Yeah. Um, but flipping houses is nothing but a, a business. It's a regular business. Yeah. The average profit margin for a business is 15 to 20%. So you're right in the middle. You're running a regular business. What does a regular business have to do? When they get profits, if you're growing, you have to reinvest that money. You can't pull that money back. You can't pull that money out. So you need to have some other source of income um, until you, you have – so many deals going at one time where you, you know you, you have excessive cash flow that, that you don't need that you don't need um i think we, we get in it too quick and like you said we get in and we see a big check and we think that can be spent mm-hmm. and it's not and you don't let's not forget about the income tax you're supposed to pay at the end of the yeah, year yeah yeah you know and all that stuff a lot of people skip over that part 
Um, but yeah, but the things I don't like about flipping in addition to that is every time you set a budget on a flip, I don't care how how many times that contractor walks that house, uh -huh. there's gonna be something that comes going up. up. You're gonna open a wall. You're gonna you're gonna get underneath the floorboard. You're gonna remove something in, in the cabinet in the attic. You're gonna find something that that needs to be repaired. Um, something else I don't like about flipping is part of the moral component of it. Um, you know, uh, a home is usually the biggest investment anybody ever makes in their life, and for the average person, right? So if you go and flip a house and you know that roof got three years left on it, but it's not bad right now, and you watch that yeah. single mom go yeah. buy that house, yeah, yeah, that single mom with that zero down payment program go buy that house, and in three years, you know she got to have that seventy five hundred dollar roof yeah. replaced. You know that, that's not good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you know some, something else is about to go bad in the house. So um, for those are some of the reasons I don't like flipping. Um, I, I flipped some houses and kept some of my own houses as rental properties, and two or three year, years later, a big expense pops up. Yeah. I'm like, I start thinking, damn, that happened to that family that bought that other house. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my moral integrity is just, that's why I love new construction a whole lot more. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm either like you, like buying rentals, yeah, um, and ju that just need cosmetic upgrades or something, or yeah. building from the ground up. Because it's the same yeah. process, but yeah. everything is brand new on the new construction. So that's actually where I'm at now. I kind of yeah. fell into it. I, mm -hmm. I bought a couple lots mm -hmm. when I started looking at the rising cost of all this construction stuff mm -hmm. and I couldn't buy houses for 10,000 anymore. Yeah. I just did the math, especially with this new ordinance they really passed here mm -hmm. where you can put a four, four yeah. units yeah. on yeah. a 5,000 square foot lot. Yeah. I had to do the math. Yeah. If it cost me three hundred thousand dollars to mm -hmm. put a fourplex up, mm -hmm. I can divide that by four, mm -hmm. and now that's seventy five thousand per door, yep. and I'm getting the same return as when I was getting the houses for twenty and thirty thousand yep. dollars at tax yep. auction. Yep. So yep. that's that's my next play yep. is ground up construction, yeah. multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, that's if I don't find the right deal on an apartment complex. Yeah. Yeah. Second thing I'll throw out that really kind of made me think. And I tell you a true story. I bought a house at the tax auction, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. I thought I was winning, man. You know, yeah. the auction is first Tuesday of every month. Yeah. I went by on Saturday. I looked at it. You know, it was a little raggedy cosmetic, yeah. maybe a few little things. So it was listed at twenty, about $28,000. Mm -hmm. I went to the auction, and I thought it was only about fifteen, twenty thousand 20000 to fix it up. Mm -hmm. And nobody else bid. I got it, $28,000. Yeah. I went to the house. Somebody had set it on fire the day before. Oh, man. So now so, I have a house that I thought I was going to put fifteen twenty in, 40% burn. Yeah. And I had to pretty much rebuild it. I had to reframe yeah. it. I had to do new electrical, yeah. all new plumbing. Mm -hmm. um, but that experience, it, it taught me basically construction. Mm -hmm. It also forced me to start dealing with the city because, you know, everybody yeah. say, don't you want to deal with the city? So yeah. I'm doing something. But now I had to pull all my permits. I learned yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. But my primary point is that you make your money when you buy. And yes. but I feel like if you flip mm -hmm. the amount of money you can make is limited. Mm -hmm. So if I would have flipped it right after I had done the construction and my budget was supposed to be about forty five thousand and mm -hmm. now I'm at eighty thousand and it's yeah. worth eighty five ninety. Mm -hmm. I'm not making any money. Yeah. But if I keep it, which I still have it today, I've already made all the money I put in back through my rents mm -hmm. and it's doubled in value. Mm -hmm. So now I have equity in it. Right. So yeah. for me, that's that's the clear cut yeah. advantage to the rentals. And also back to the houses I started out with when I lost that I mm -hmm. told you about. What I found too is when you have that note, you got a tenant in there, everything's going good, you're making your little two, three hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But when you got two, three of them, the mm -hmm. tenant leaves, mm -hmm. now you're trying to keep them up, yeah, yeah. plus your house at home, mm -hmm. and now you you putting band-aids on stuff, yeah. and then you got the tenant that you know ain't necessarily that qualified, but mm -hmm. you just want to stop the bleeding, and they yeah. say, I got my deposit right here. Mm -hmm. So you take that deposit, put them in there, and yeah. then it just starts to snowball, yep. man. Yep. So I, I've been there. <laughs> so how many years you been doing this now? Uh, 15. 15 yeah, years. Since 2008. So yeah, 15 years. Okay. Yeah, man. So I'll end it here, and this is typically the question that we, we always pose this question in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Rewind the hands back, young 20-year-old mm -hmm. Chris, 15-year-old Chris, wherever that pivotal moment in your life was, what would mm -hmm. be the advice that you would give that young man to advise him on his path to success? And inherently, to that person out there that's just starting off, that's mm -hmm. listening, what would be the advice mm -hmm. that you would give them? Number one, just just kind of personally living life, but also mm -hmm. if they really want to make money in real estate. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, number one, I'm gonna tell you this. Forget the mindset that you were taught in school. 
uh, we are taught in school that the best people are the ones that are n right more than 90% of the time. So if you fail more than 10% of the time, you're, you're not going to be successful. That is not true. Do not be afraid to fail. Failure is just feedback on what you need to adjust to be successful. That person that was used to failing 30% of the time, that 70 average, they graduated and got the same diploma you got, right? And a lot of them might be entrepreneurs right now because they couldn't go get the jobs, but they're, they're more comfortable with getting things wrong. That's one, number one. Number two, it's okay to be a copycat if you're copying off the right cat. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that. Yeah. I'm going to give you credit the first time after that is mine, so I like that. <laughs> So, so I stole that from uh, Holton Bugs. Um, okay, he's a big network marketing guy. Okay, um, but yeah, uh, yeah, find somebody that's already doing what you want to do, and I don't care if you got to pay, if you got to volunteer to work for free just to hang around, or or bring them a, an opportunity that makes sense where you may not get the most of it, even if they get more. That shortcut to learning is a whole lot better than trying to figure it out yourself and failing and being like us and having foreclosures and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Losing tens you of had thousands. had foreclosures too. <laughs> we, we all did. We all tried to figure it out on our own. But I, I learned yeah. like if, if you partner with somebody that's already successful, yeah. they'll they'll know things and they'll guide you away from obstacles you never even thought would even exist. So I'm I'm glad you mentioned that we had a gentleman on the uh, show. His name is Corey Muldrow. Okay. I don't know if you know him. He was I believe he was at the uh, game day as well okay. with OJ. Okay. So ironically, I mentored OJ. Yeah. OJ mentored him. I love it. And he's out doing all of us. Yeah. He has, I think, close to a thousand units. Yeah. All in the Dallas area. I love it. I love and it. And what he shared is he started out kind of in a and I I don't want to I don't know if crowdfunding is the right deal, but well, he was kind of in an investment group. Mm -hmm. So he just kind of put some money in. Yeah. He kind of saw what was going on. And then mm -hmm. he kind of said, Well, I think I can do this on yeah. my own. Yeah. So the 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 point was he got in. Mm -hmm. learned under someone else, mm -hmm. made a return, mm -hmm. learned the game, and then went out on his own. Yeah. So pardon me if I'm correct, if I'm incorrect, but what you're doing is helping a lot of folk out there that want to get started, oh, yeah. and they can invest with you. Right. You got the experience, mm -hmm. you got the knowledge, yeah. and they can grow their money by mm -hmm. investing with you, yep. learn the process, and if they want to go out on their own, go out on their own. So. Yep. That being said, if I said anything incorrect, correct no, me. No, that's all right. Yeah. But if everything I said is correct, yeah. tell these people how they can get in contact with you, man. How can they invest with you? Well, I'm pretty sure we have a lower third or something with my name on it somewhere. Chris Senegal, everywhere, every platform. You can just look me up, uh, Instagram, YouTube. Um, if you want to learn about the new construction process, I have a course called noflips.com. It teaches you the entire process from start to finish and who you need on your team. It doesn't teach you to be a contractor it just teaches you how to hire the contractor the architects the, the right broker everybody that you, that you need to execute a, a project start to finish awesome awesome well chris i've heard so much about you but yeah. we've seen each other at different right, events yeah. but it's we've been trying to make this happen for a while but i'm really yeah. excited to have had you here great information i commend you on what you're doing for the community and i really look forward to uh kind of seeing your success in the future. So thank you for joining us on the Black Money Tree Podcast. Likewise, likewise. Looking forward to the next Black Expo also. All right. It's in May. We're going to be looking for you. There so. we go. All right. So Appreciate thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Black Money Tree Podcast. Thank you again, Chris. Yeah. And make sure you check Chris out on all of his platforms at Chris Senegal. And, of course, go to BeARealEstateInvestor.com as well. Learn some more about my journey and some of the things that we learned along the way. And as Chris say, Next Black Expo is going to be May in 2024 here in Houston, Texas, and we look forward to seeing you there. And thank you for tuning in to the Black Money Tree Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Black Money Tree Podcast. Don't forget to like and share this video. And if you want more content like this, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll see you next time.